people seem to have misread something somewhere, right? The, the multiverse is a hypothesis, right? So it's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. It's an idea for the solution. So people say to me, oh, it's not testable. And I have to ask them, well, how do you know? How do you know that a multiverse theory is not testable? Because we don't have a multiverse theory. We have a hypothesis. And we still need people to develop the series to know whether or not the multiverse picture is testable or not. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with Mishka, the pod dog. You can see his his little little snoot there. Uh, but I am here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 152. And here comes Pins. And this episode is with Geraint F. Lewis, who is professor of astrophysics at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy and the University of Sydney School of Physics. And while the focus of Geraint's research is on dark matter and energy, which do come up in the course of our conversation, Geraint has written about and worked on many topics in cosmology and astrophysics more generally, from galactic archaeology, which isn't unrelated to dark matter and dark energy, uh, to fine-tuning, which is just what we talk about in this episode. Fine-tuning has come up a number of times on the show, but the question is this. Our universe seems very, very well suited for life. I mean, that's why we're here. But with just the, the slightest variations to certain aspects of physics, we wouldn't exist. So we talk about just what these parameters are that are so sensitive, whether that's the Higgs boson or the the forces of the standard model and so on, and how they can be accounted for, whether that's just through sheer coincidence or the existence of God or a multiverse conception of the of the universe, I guess that's sort of paradoxical, but a multiverse where all the different possible realizations of physics are out there and so on. And Geraint has written about this in a book called A Fortunate Universe, the link to which is in the description. And I like to mention that reviews, comments, likes, subscribes are all so helpful. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Geraint. A lot of physicists that I've that I've spoken to or that I've I've read about, they don't seem to have that much of an interest in philosophy. So Stephen Hawking is famous for saying that it's it's dead. Yet the the question of fine tuning really straddles the line. And I was wondering, do you remember when it first grabbed your attention? Have you always been interested in the bigger questions? Though it's it's hard to think of bigger questions than theoretical physics and cosmology to begin with. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Well, look, I've always been interested in in the physics of the universe. But I guess um, the the starting point for the fine tuning journey was actually when I was an undergraduate, because that's when that famous book, the the cosmological anthropic principle by um, uh, Bar- Barrow and Tipler, came out. And I had that, and I looked over it. I remember reading it a bit when I was an undergrad, and not quite grasping the full argument. And so I revisited it, uh, the the question, like just over a decade or so ago now. And realized that there there are some peculiarities about this universe that you know w- when you think about it, they sort of make you go, well, why is it this way? Why isn't it some other way? And of course, as you said, that you you immediately run into um, philosophical kind of of ideas, and m- many physicists don't want to tread in those kind of questions. To many physicists, right, physics is only about the physics of this universe and not pondering about where the universe came from, is it related to other universes, et cetera. So I, I have been sort of thinking about this for, for quite a while, but yeah, it, it's, it really was in the last 10 years or so that it really come, it came into focus. 
Yeah, I haven't read the book that you mentioned, but I understand and we'll, we'll get to it that the anthropic principle has come in many different flavors and revisions. So weak and strong and so on. But for now, I mean, fine tuning has come up here and there on the show before. So today an episode just came out with Andy Strominger of Harvard, where it came up brief, briefly just because it's connected to string theory and the multiverse. But I thought that this would be an ideal opportunity to really go deep into what it is. And in doing so, put a lot of different concepts from physics and astronomy together. And just to start, as as you do in a fortunate universe, I think to provide a, a bit of a foil for the fine-tuned universe, we might talk about a couple of ways in which the Earth appears, and I'll, I'll stress this word, appears fine-tuned for us, just to because it contrasts very much with the fine-tuned universe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, quite clearly... The, the the earth is fine tuned for us because you know we have bones which are strong enough to hold us up against the gravity um we 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 breathe oxygen and we live in an atmosphere which is rich with oxygen we rely on plants that uh grow in sunlight and the sun puts out just the right kind of frequencies for those plants to grow and so you know we we can have this idea that oh the earth was somehow made for us right we we, it's just such a natural environment for us to be in. And of course, I think the, the theological view over much of human history has had that kind of notion that, you know, the, the world is for us and, it, it, you know, all its bountiful riches are, are for us to enjoy. But of course, what we have learned over the last couple of hundred years, the reason why we have this apparent fine tuning of us to the earth is that uh, we evolved here, right? So, um, the, all of our ancestors have been in, in similar environments, not identical environments, but similar environments in terms of gravity, atmosphere, et cetera. And we should not be surprised to find that, uh, we fit in very well with, with this planetary surface. And of course, we can imagine that if we had evolved on a planet which was, uh, you know, denser, so it had a higher gravitational field, that our bones would be stronger, maybe uses me more metal than anything, et cetera. So we can, we can envisage that if you do find life on a planet, it will be suited to the planet that you find it on. It, it, I mean, you wouldn't expect, uh, you know, to go to a planet where uh, everything is, uh, you know, gravity is 10 times stronger and everything's bones are made of some sort of brittle material which fractures instantaneously, right? It, it, you, life will be suited to the environment in which you find it. Right. And evolution, as you say, is key here. And I'll, I'll stress that it's it's not just our immediate ancestors of 10,000 or even 10 or 100 million years ago. I just uh, a couple of days ago had an episode with a I, I still get it sort of I'm not sure if he's a, a paleobiologist or a geobiologist or an archaeobiologist at Harvard. But we talked about the dawn of life on Earth and Earth is 4.5 billion years ago. Five point billion years old, life's been around for four billion years, but the earth shaped us. And we, I mean, by we here, I mean our microbial ancestors like cyanobacteria that filled the atmosphere with oxygen, they shaped the earth too. So we humans gradually developed over time to fit into the world that preceded us. So while the earth appears to have been fine tuned for us at first glance, perhaps if we found an alien planet with no other life, but somehow with an atmosphere perfectly suited to us, we would think it really was fine-tuned for us. But we know that that isn't the case for Earth. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I, again, this this entire thing about evolution of life on Earth, this insight we've gathered over the last uh, couple of hundred years, it, it, it is, as you say, um, we have shaped the environment and the environment has shaped us, right? So so if, if uh, an alien civilization could spy on the earth from afar and take a spectrum, they would realize that there was something odd about the earth, right? That we have this atmosphere, which is rich in oxygen. And that's, that's not a normal state for an atmosphere to be in, right? That oxygen not, would get um, wrapped up in, in, in with iron and rocks, etc. cetera. Um, so something is maintaining this out of equilibrium atmosphere, which is one of those signs, signs for life. 
so yeah, it's it's it it's a uh, we, we're suited to this planet, but the bigger question uh, with regards to our place in the universe is a somewhat different one, and I think this is where people uh, immediately run into problems with regards to the idea of cosmological fine tuning because they take the notion of life on Earth. Uh, and the fact that we've evolved here and then try to apply that to the universe and they sort of miss the mark when it comes to the actual fine-tuning argument. Hmm. Yeah, and I think this is a, a good time then to switch from the Earth to the fine-tuning of the universe. So in what senses, and there are a lot, so we'll get to them, but in what major senses do the universe appear to have been fine-tuned for us? And maybe, I mean, just to phrase this differently so that it takes out the the question of who does the fine tuning which I, I think it immediately comes from the way that the question tends to be phrased what sorts of delicate aspects of this universe's physics make life like us possible well I think the starting point has to be remembering that um, you know in our laws of physics we have these these numbers that uh, we need to basically run the laws of physics. So if, if I, you know, Newton wrote out his formula for gravity, GMM over R squared, which everybody learns in school, but you can't do anything with that equation until you work out what the G in that equation is. And you, the only way you can uh, find that is by asking nature. So the famous Cavendish experiment for measuring the gravitational constant. So physics is filled with these constants that have specific values. Uh, and there's, there's nothing in our theories that tell us why these numbers are the way they are. And, you know, some of them, um, you know, the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the fine structure constant, all of these numbers, all the way through physics, physics is sterile until you, you've nailed down those numbers. So we can play this game immediately as physicists. We can start to ask ourselves, how, how would the universe have been different if these numbers had been different? Would it all have just played out somewhat the same and things would be slightly different? And so we can look at things like, what happens if you mess with, say, the mass of the electron or the mass of the quarks, which make up the protons and the neutrons, or the strength of gravity or uh, um, electromagnetism, etc.? And it's one of those uh, things where there's, there's, there's almost a butterfly effect in the sense that uh, the, the changes that you make to the small-scale universe propagate to large effects when you look at the universe as a whole. So there's a couple of the ones uh, that um, that I, I think are very telling. Of course, the, the the mass of the electron, right? The electron is small compared to protons and neutrons in atoms, and so we have this picture of the atom, and you know you've got your nucleus, you've got an electron going around the outside, and the electrons are the things that talk with other atoms, and that's all kind of fine. But if you start to like wind up the mass of the electron, right? So it's, it's like one two thousandth the mass of the proton. If you start to wind that up, okay, and you make the electron more massive, then instead of there just being a nucleus with this electron whizzing around outside, there's now a tug of war going on between the two of these. And that means is that that outer part of the electron, uh, where the electrons live, when they talk to other atoms, instead of there being just like this, you know, the, the, the way chemistry works, like oh, an electron will hop over here, etc. They are re really basically thumping against each other. And that has a Big implication for for solid material, right? The stuff which you need for planets and and planetary surfaces and all this kind of stuff. You can you can start to disrupt that by winding up the mass of the electron and making it kind of heavy. Now you have to go quite a long way with the electron, right, to make it massive enough to um uh, to to really be uh you know something that's very disruptive, but. The, the the change is actually kind of small compared to the potential range that an electron mass could be. And it's very hard to, to judge what that could be. But of course, the, at the bottom end, electrons could be massless. They have no mass at all. We, uh, and where's the upper end? And if you talk to the quantum people, they, they'll, the string theorists, et cetera, they'll tell you that's the Planck mass. And the Planck mass is huge, right? It's, the, it, it's, a, it's a, a grain of dust, which is much, much bigger than the mass of the electron. So we can adjust the mass of the electron, and if it was, was up at the higher scale, we would clearly be in a very different universe. And we, we play the same games with, with quarks inside protons and neutrons. And it, uh, the, one of the things that we have in the universe, of course, is that the 
proton is ever so slightly, only like fractions of percent less massive than the neutron, which means that neutrons decay into protons and not the other way around. So we end up with the, the these nuclei that we have for atoms. But if it was the other way, if we adjusted the, the masses of the up and down quarks, we could make the neutron slightly less massive than the proton, which would mean that protons would decay into neutrons. And that would mean that we would have a universe full of um, neutrons, and neutrons are useless, right? Electrons don't join onto neutrons to form atoms, right? So you just have this sea of particles that don't join together, they're neutral, they just all sit there. So it, so what you can quickly do, and this is what we, we, we find when we look at all of these different experiments, uh, thought experiments, is that we, you rob the universe of the potential for complexity, Okay, so a universe filled with neutrons is a boring universe where there are no atoms, there's no solid material, there's no stars. And clearly in that kind of universe, there's going to be no life. And I said, if you, so if you play this game, you adjust all the constants and, and with the quark masses, it's only a little bit, then you, you rapidly end up with dead and sterile universes, either universes which uh, are, are effectively empty, so there's nothing in there at all, or universes filled with things like neutrons, where you know the the, the thought of a periodic table it's, it, that's just a dream. You can't do anything in that kind of universe. So yeah, it, it's easy to wipe out complexity and therefore the the possibility or the prospects for life in those universes. Hmm. Well, this is this is exactly the game I want to play because, like I said earlier, it's a great opportunity to talk about some of these other numbers beyond the electron, the electron to get a sense of some of the big topics in theoretical physics and astronomy. But before we uh, go into more particularities and see how our universe might have been totally unrecognizable or recognizable, is what you just said a few minutes ago, that as we tinker with these numbers, we might rob the universe of the potential for complexity. Is that the the key sort of dimension of fine tuning that we're figuring out how much can things be messed around with and maintain the complexity that can result in life uh, absolutely so one of the the biggest problems with the anthropic principle is the anthropic part of it right because it, uh, people think the argument is based upon humans people but it's not it's about the ability for the universe to host complexity we we are a result of the complexity in this universe in the sense that we have a, uh, a periodic table with 92 natural elements. Those elements can combine together to give you molecules. Those molecules can process information, right? And we are, we are molecular machines. That's what we are. We are essentially the, the, the periodic table written on, in large form in the universe. So it is about that complexity because at some level, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, without without getting into what with the definition of what life is and what life could be, the the notion of having a, a complexity in your environment for information process and energy processing is one of the key requirements that we're looking at. So yeah, it's, it's like the base level that we start with is can this, can this universe host complexity? Hmm. Well, Drink, before we continue, maybe it would be a good idea to lay out just what the anthropic principle is since it's come up a couple of times i don't think we've defined it and there are there are a few different ways that it's been formulated yes uh so the one of the problems is it hasn't been consistently uh defined across different definitions and the same names are used um so i th i think the, the 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 basic definition right of the weak anthropic principle is that we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves in a universe that can host us. At, at some level, this is akin to the, the argument about, you know, why we are suited to life on earth. Uh, it is that, you know, we, we should not be surprised that we exist in this universe and are made of molecules, especially made of lots of carbon, because we live in a universe which is rich with carbon and all the other things stars can burn. So that kind of statement is is almost like the boring notion of what the anthropic principle is. And in fact, that's when many people, they, they think that's as far as it goes. And then they, they say, right, that's the end of the discussion. 
it's it's a it's a circular argument in the sense that we shouldn't we shouldn't expect to find ourselves in a universe where we can't exist. But the the more rigid definition when we start to get into things is this question of the mix of the actual physical laws that we have and the notion that if our universe had been born slightly differently then we would be in a universe that could not host life in any form and so the question is 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 and which is it's tied to this you know the fine tuning principle is what is there something about our universe that makes it special in terms of the physical laws such that we are here now asking the question about the state of the universe and so we you know we have that question about yeah why this mix of the laws of physics and I, and as we mentioned a moment ago to to many physicists that's not a physics question right they, you know the physics is is that you, you, here's a universe work out how everything works in here based upon those laws. But yeah, what we want to do is go deeper and ask why this mix of physical laws that we have. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny, when we give talks on this to, to physicists, so many sometimes it's a, they, they say, well, again, it's not, it's not a question where we, we want to tread, but others get really involved in and thinking about how the universe would be different. We can end up with big, long discussions about all kinds of aspects of the universe, um, which would change if we, if we change the laws of physics, right? So I said, what you end up with doing is it finding it very easy to wipe out the complexity in this universe by adjusting the laws of physics. So yeah, so that, that's where it sort of boils down to is, is, why is why does it look like this universe is special? And, and it's special, again, in that question of complexity, not necessarily in uh, being a universe for us, right? It's, it's the complexity that we have in the universe that's important. Hmm. Just to make sure that I'm on the same page, I'd like to try to, to re rehash the two of them and put them in my own words and, and see if I'm right. So the weak anthropic principle is the not very surprising uh, maybe borderline tautologous assertion that um, the universe has to be the way it is for us to observe it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. I mean, if there weren't carbon, we wouldn't be here. But then the strong anthropic principle, the why question comes in and it says, or we're asking, how is it that it could be this specific why is everything so perfectly fine-tuned? And that demands a much deeper sort of explanation, apparently. Uh, yes. Well, but again, it, it depends, who you, depends who you talk to, right? <laughs> yes, I mean, yes. I said, if, if, if you want to start an argument with physicists in the pub, you, you bring up things like the anthropic principle, right? Um, but, but if you think about it, then th there are, there's only a few sort of possibilities on the table, right? I mean, if... In reality, um, it, it has to be something to do with the mechanism that brought this universe into being. So if you think about it, if our, if our universe is a, a one-off event, um, then something was special in the initial conditions of the universe to ensure that we had that um, ability to form the complexity that we have around us. So that, that is one way of thinking about it. It's just that, you know, somewhere in the initial conditions of the universe um, are written, right, and this universe will form complexity. But then you just push the problem somewhere else, right? You know, why, why these initial conditions? Now, there, is, there are some physicists, of course, who think that the, these numbers that we have in our, our theories, these, these fundamental constants, that they're not truly free numbers, right? They're not free values. And that maybe if we think really, really hard, we will come up with a mathematical expression that involves you no know, pi and E and the golden ratio or whatever to, to give us the mass of the electron compared to the mass of the proton or something like that. So that there is that there, there is no freedom in the choice of the physics that we have in the universe, that they are written ultimately into the mathematics of the universe. But you just then left asking the question, well, why, why this co combination of mathematics? 
Uh, because, of course, you know, in, in terms of the library of all potential mathematics, physics only uses a small part of it. The, the, the mathematician's library is much, much bigger than the, 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 the maths that we use to describe the universe. Why, why did we take this book off the shelf for this universe and not that one, which would have given us a very diff, a different kind of universe? So it, what, what, what we're left with is some other mechanism for writing those initial conditions. And of course, uh, this is where the arguments get a, get a little bit uh, aggressive. Is aggressive the right word? Yeah, well, it's hard to say anymore. We're, no, on the internet, everybody shouts at everybody else. But of course, on, on one side, you get the theological aspect where people say that, of, of course, uh, the, speci- the initial conditions for our universe are special because the universe was at some level made for us, right? It was created for, for us by some divine being, etc. Um, but if you think about the potential physical solutions, then th- there has to be something about the way um, either our universe, I said, was special in a one-off event that for some reason we don't understand the initial conditions were written the way they are, or we have a mechanism whereby the universe is just one of many universes. And we, we run into the idea of the multiverse, that, that there is this process, a universe-generating process going on where universes are spat out through some mechanism that we really don't have a handle on. But each universe, as it's created, there's effectively a, a roll of the cosmic dice somewhere, right? Physics is chosen at random, and each universe gets... Uh, its own laws of physics, and ours is somewhere in the mix. Ours was the one that, you know, roll snake eyes. Is snake eyes good or bad? I can never remember. But, you know, <coughs> got that role that we got the right combination of the laws of physics. So here's our universe with a bubble of of life in it. But out there, then, there are uncountable numbers of other universes which are dead and sterile. And so some people th- sort of see this picture as being exceedingly wasteful, Right that you have to produce 10 to the 2,000 dead universes for our one universe to, with the, the right combination of physics in there for, for there being life. So yeah, it, it, again, it, it leads to lots of arguments about why, why would the overall process be, be so inefficient? Why would we just be producing dead universes over and over again? And then you, you, you run into... Uh, things like like Lee Smolin's idea that in fact it's it's an evolution uh, it's more of an evolutionary process where universes with life beget universes with life kind of thing through the formation of black holes. So people try and get around that, but yeah, it's a it's one of those questions that it's it's not obvious exactly where the answer lies. Mm-hmm. Well, a, a couple of things. Even in math, the the primitives or axioms, maybe the analogs of initial conditions, they do have to stop somewhere. An end comes where you have to, or you can't just keep asking why, or what, why is this a point? Um, why the membership relation in set theory, things like this. But you've touched on th- at least three aspects, not necessarily disconnected of, of fine tuning that I'd like to get to, whether or not this is a one-off event or the universe is a one-off event. Uh, initial conditions, the role perhaps of divine beings. But I'd like to return back to where we started with the electrons, up quarks, down quarks, and just stick for the moment with the standard particle model. So let's uh, maybe talk a bit about the the forces, strong, weak, and electromagnetic, electromagnetic, sorry. Would life be able to work if any of them were entirely gotten rid of? Well, that's an interesting question. So I, I think I think people think that the only one we can get rid of is the weak force. In that, you know, weak force is essentially responsible for uh, some aspects of radioactivity. So maybe that, so there was a paper a few years ago called on the weakless universe. Um, so maybe, maybe the problem that we have is that. Um, some people really think that the weak force has played a more important role in the life of the universe than it does now. And the, 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 
the weak force has some very interesting aspects as, that are not shared by the other forces. And, and what, one of those aspects is that the weak force is the only force which shows a symmetry, right? And what I mean by that is that if you take electromagnetism and you take a positive charge and a negative charge, so matter and antimatter, electromagnetism doesn't care, right? The interaction between matter and antimatter is exactly the same. And same with, with, uh, um, with the strong force as well, right? The strong force doesn't care, right? But the weak force has some asymmetries in it. And so, you know, there's this, this famous thing about, you know, this was first predicted back in the 1950s by Yang and Li in, in 55 or 56. And there was a famous experiment done by Wu, which showed that there, there's this parity asymmetry in the universe. And it was like, what, it, uh, it may have been the fastest Nobel Prize in physics, where one year it took for that Nobel Prize to be awarded. Um, and it shows that to the weak force, matter and antimatter are seen differently. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because in our universe, we know that we have lots of matter and we have very little antimatter. And that was written into the universe at the very earliest stages, well before about a, a millionth, when the universe was about a millionth of a second old, that there was this asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So it's, you know, it's called the, um, the baryon asymmetry problem, the matter-antimatter problem. It is why the universe is dominated by matter, because if, uh, the weak force uh, played by the same rules as the other forces and was symmetrical when it comes to matter and antimatter. And it was playing its role in the early universe. Then what we would have expected is that the uni early universe would have been born with equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And then as the universe cooled, that matter and antimatter annihilated and it would have left you with no matter or man antimatter at all. You would have just left you with a soup of, of radiation. So why, why was there the, this asymmetry in the early universe? And some people have tried to tie it to the asymmetry that we see in the weak force. It looks like it, the weak force can't be responsible for all of it. But it, if, we, you know, if we did remove the weak force from the universe, maybe our universe would have been born perfectly symmetrical and perfect symmetry would have been bad because we would have had no matter left in the universe. And of course, with no matter, what's the chances of life, right? If you had a universe just filled with light. Another way that I saw, and I hadn't heard of this dimension of fine tuning before, uh, another way that radioactivity and thus the electric, the um, the weak force play a role in our life, at least, is that the Earth wouldn't be hot and safe without it because of what's going on in the core. Yes, yeah. So the, yeah, this is this is a, a kind of interesting one that um, it, it sounds quite quite kind of. Um, complex if you think about it but you know when we look at the other planets like like mars right so mars doesn't have a magnetic field right and so one of the things we think about with mars is that it's cooled down and its core has solidified and so its core is rotating slowly and so it doesn't generate a magnetic field which means that things like the the solar wind hit the surface of mars so, you know, if we, if we went to Mars, we would probably have to live underground to shield us from things like the solar wind. Here on Earth, of course, what we have is we have a, a, a core which is still effectively hot and molten and rotates relatively quickly. And, and that generates a, a magnetic field, which, which essentially deflects the solar wind to the north and south pole. So we have been protected here on the surface of the Earth from the, the flux from the, the sun by the presence of this magnetic field. And the, so the, the thing is, is that, but the, the Earth has been around for a long, long time. Why hasn't its core cooled down and solidified? And as you say, it's because elements have sunk to the, the center of the Earth. We still have radioactivity kicking off. That keeps the core hot and keeps it molten. And so we still maintain this magnetic field. And it, there, there's a, an interesting book called um, um, Rare Earth by... Uh, who is it? Warden Brownlee, I think it's called, um, which talks about this, that, that that's probably pay, played an important role in life on Earth. It's, it's basically shielding us from this uh, 
flux from the sun, especially during um, times of things like solar storms, because that flux rapidly increases. And what we know is that that, that high energy particles coming from the sun, that causes molecular damage and, and you know, it causes uh, uh, DNA damage and, and things like that. So it, it has probably allowed the the genetic material, a more stable environment in which to do its thing over billions and billions of years. And maybe if um, if we had been, been bombarded by the, the flux from the, the sun, then essentially, you know, your genetics would be like, things would be starting and then stopping and breaking and all this kind of thing. But there wouldn't be this nice continuous progression for billions of years where things have built up. So yeah, so the weak force definitely still plays a role for for life on earth um but but yeah that so that's that's a more convoluted story about how it's probably had an influence right yeah the this dimension of radioactivity and the core is neat and, and fortunate for us but as you just said it if the weak force were gone, it sounds like it wouldn't preclude all life. It just, in our case, would produce, preclude life. So it's not devastating to complexity in the universe the way that tinkering with the quarks might. Yeah, unless, of course, the weak force was responsible for the baryon asymmetry. Uh, if it was, oh, and we right. remove yeah. it, then then all bets are off, right? No matter in the universe whatsoever. So, you know, that that's one thing that we still really need to understand. Hmm. Well, so if... <laughs> This this uh, one issue aside, if we could only get rid of the weak force, then what would happen if the strong or electromagnetic forces were were tinkered with? Well, so one of the important things, of course, uh, well, you have to remember when the universe was hot and young. Um, so we had this this stages of of nucleosynthesis, the formation of the first elements. And they are, that's essentially a game being played off between the, the strong force and electromagnetism, right? So those are the two forces that really matter in the early universe. And that can influence how elements form into, into hydrogen, helium, and then the heavier elements. Um, if you think about the nucleus of an atom, right? So what, what is the nucleus of an atom? It's a combination of protons and neutrons, Okay. So in that ball, you've got the strong force that's pulling everything together, but you also have electromagnetism, which is trying to force all of those protons apart. And in fact, th there's a huge amount of energy locked up in the nucleus of an atom due to the electromagnetic force in there. People, people sort of get this wrong. The, the atomic bomb was, was not a release of nuclear energy in the sense that it was from the strong force. The atomic bomb is powered by electromagnetism. When you separate, if you take a big nucleus and you separate it into two, you've got lots of charged particles close together and they, they whiz apart at high speed. That's what the energy release in an atomic bomb is. So there's a huge amount of energy in there. And so there's sort of like a, 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 a balancing point, right? So the strong force has to overwhelm the electromagnetic force if that nucleus is going to stay stable. And the, the closer and closer that we bring these two forces together in terms of their strength, then the less stable nuclei become. So like we, we, um, we have in our periodic table, of course, we've got the elements and they've got isotopes. And there's this thing called the valley of stability, right? The combinations of pro protons and neutrons means that we have effectively stable versions of all the elements going up from hydrogen out to uranium. And that means is that in those nuclei, then what you've got is, is uh, the strong force overwhelming electromagnetism and it stays that way. But if you start to play around with the, those, those nuclei, you put in, put in more or less neutrons, then you get radioactivity, right? So you get... Um, you get elements, that, so the, the nuclei basically decay in either alpha decay or even spitting out an, uh, an electron or a positron, you get decays. So if you start to mess around with the relative strengths of electromagnetism and the uh, strong force, one thing you can do very easily 
is you can erase the value of stability. So this, this notion that, we, that most elements have a stable isotope, you can basically make that disappear. You can make everything radioactive. And that's probably a bad thing, right? Because if you Im imagine, again, molecular life, then you don't want to build your molecules out of things that are going to decay on relatively short timescales. You need your molecules to be stable over the time that you're going to use those molecules. So like the DNA inside your cells, you want that to be stable for a very long time until it's needed and, uh, and you know, separates and builds new DNA, et cetera. But if, if, you, if, if all elements become radioactive, then you know, your DNA is made up of, of phosphorus and, and uh, oxygen and all those kind of things, carbon. Then if they start popping off, then your, your DNA's ability to store information just completely disappears, right? So uh, your molecules would break down. They would, they would change from one molecule to another. That would be bad. But it turns out that, that you, might, you might say to yourself, oh, well, we can solve that problem, right? Well, all we do is we make the strong force even stronger. And what, what you do then is, is you're, you broaden the value of stability. So what, what, instead of there being like one stable carbon atom, your nature now is a choice of, say, 10, just changed by the, the mix of neutrons that you have. Um, and you might say to yourself, well, what, what influence is that going to have? They're all carbon. Right? The electrons don't care about how much mass is in the nucleus. They'll still behave like it's a carbon atom. But of course, when you form a molecule out of, um, out of atoms, then the shape of that molecule depends upon the masses of each of those atoms. And so if you imagine that you're trying to build a molecule with carbon in there, and you have one carbon which is uh, you know, half the mass of another carbon atom, that means that when you construct those molecules, then they're all going to have different shapes, right? Because, you know, I'll, gra I'll grab a, a light carbon atom and a heavy oxygen atom, et cetera, put them together. And again, you might say, well, who cares? Uh, the big problem is, is that your life cares because we are molecular machines and all molecules work by basically fitting together like jigsaw pieces, right? You know, we saw this a lot with, with COVID and how viruses have molecular receptors that fit into this kind of thing and that kind of thing. Those things have very well-defined shapes. And if you have a molecule with the wrong shape, it just doesn't work, okay? So by introducing more complexity, you can actually, again, run into the problem that you can't get the key features that you need for life by having more choice of of atoms, we, we, with complexity, again, thinking about more complex universes is harder than less complex universes. But it seems to me that, you know, if you end up with um, a million different ways to construct the same molecule, that that's bad for life because you need things to be self-reproducing. Hmm. No, okay, this is, this is very interesting. Uh, first, though, this is tangential, but you mentioned a common misconception about atomic bombs a few minutes ago. And so when you say that the atom bomb's explosive force comes from electromagnetism, I mean, it comes from the separation of positively charged protons. But for the force to have been generated by the, for the explosion to have been generated by the strong force, which is what people tend to think, that would mean the energy from the bomb would have to come from the protons themselves being ripped into quarks? Not quite so my microphone's going to be dodgy here let me just fix that um not quite so uh, th th this is so let's let's imagine how a, a an atom bomb works so you know we've all just seen oppenheimer so you know of course they didn't tell us uh, about a much about the physics but you've got like a big plutonium or uranium atom and so in there there's lots of protons which are uh, close together right so what have you got um, you put another neutron in there, okay? And then this splits into two nuclei, okay? So, so these two nuclei are no longer joined together by the strong force. They've got their own strong force inside holding them together. And uh, what you've got now is two strongly charged particles, so, sorry, two strongly charged nuclei 
and they are, they're a, a, a tiny separation apart. So you can calculate how much energy is in that situation. It's huge. So you basically, that then accelerates these guys away from each other. And that's the explosive power of the atom bomb. So the question is then, where did, where did that come from? You know, the, the packing of the protons and neutrons together to give you the big nucleus. And of course, that comes from massive stars. So the, the, the forces that put the, the nuclei together were, were gravity. Essentially, gravity squeezed things together hard enough that they could overcome electromagnetism and the strong force could bind them together. Then you had them tied together. When you, when you have an atom bomb, then you, you basically break that connection and then they, they, they separate away. So, the, of course, the other one is the fusion bomb, right? So that's when, when you take deuterium and you combine deuterium into uh, helium and that is the strong force release in energy. So that's the strong. That's uh, when you've got two two uh, deuteriums. You combine them together. The strong force grabs hold of them, and they they go into a lower energy state, and that releases a high energy photon. So fusion bombs are powered by the strong force release in its energy, but the the atomic bombs are powered by you breaking the strong force. And then the energy that's released is electromagnetism, which forces itself apart. Mm. And if, deuterium- if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, it does. Deuterium is a, an isotope of hydrogen. So you're talking about hydrogen bombs when you're talking about fusion bombs? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, and you, you use deuterium uh, because deuterium can fuse. Lone protons can't. You can, so, so you can't stick two protons together to make a diproton because there's no such thing as a diproton in our universe. Uh, and you also can't stick two neutrons together. So what you, you start with is deuterium because they can fuse together because deuterium exists. That, that's another one of the fine-tuning questions, actually, is why we don't have diprotons and dineutrons in the universe. That, but that's, a, that's a, a longer discussion about the lives of stars. Okay, and then we don't have to dwell on this too long. I'm just curious, but is there a possible bomb that works the way that I described that generates... for? or that generates energy from protons being pulled apart? Um, if you want to generate uh, g- generate that kind of energy, what you want to do is you want to be putting protons together because that releases the strong force. I mean, you, um, if, you, if you pull... Um, it, it, no, if you want to shred a proton, you've got to put a lot of energy in. So this is what the Large Hadron Collider does, right? So you take two protons and you smash them together at high speed. That can rip the protons apart, but the universe so into into loose quarks. But the universe doesn't like loose quarks. Immediately, uh, there's so much energy in those loose quarks is that they they basically summon quarks out of the vacuum and they they create these these jets uh, of material because 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 there's so much potential there when you have a lone quark that it can pull other material out of seemingly nothing to create these quark jets. So there probably is, but I, I hope physicists don't go down the road of producing more powerful bombs. We've got enough at the moment. Yes, no, no, perfectly fair. Uh, then re- returning to the thread that we just left off, which is this idea of introducing more complexity by strengthening the strong force and that in turn... Uh, possibly precluding or limiting the possibility of life. One, tell me if you think I'm on the right track here, but one way I see this, not just considering what would happen if uh, suddenly the, the nuclear, the strong force were stronger, but if we think about what uh, some primordial Earth, the way Earth life is presumed to have arisen on Earth, forgetting like the panspermia hypothesis, things like that, is that through... Uh, volcanic activity through lightning, things like this, uh, organic molecules just formed in the the primitive soup and then gradually con- combined together over eons and uh, mutated until they were self-replicating, until they formed primitive cell walls, uh, methods of propulsion, this sort of thing. But if if these primitive constituents were all the more complex, it would just be all the more unlikely that they could combine uh, 
and form these self-replicating sort of structures because they would be the, the constituents of the earth would be so much more rarefied because there'd be so many more different types of things. Is that, does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, I think so. I mean, you could imagine that uh, life itself might be able to sort through the molecules, but once you've got more complex life, you've got molecular machines, et cetera. But if the choices are so huge that you, you're never going to find the right molecule, then that really does, you know, start to really hinder what what can actually happen right so as we as we lower complexity we really eliminate the possibility for life but as we increase it it just becomes much 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 more difficult yeah it comes becomes much harder to understand exactly exactly how life could take advantage of that complexity. So as my colleague, Luke Barnes, who I wrote the book with, you know, he has this really nice thing that he has in his talks. He points out, you know, if you, if you said, you know, bring the nuclear energy and the, um, uh, and the electromagnetic energy about the same, they're, they're currently different about a, by a factor of around a hundred thousand, which is why a nuclear bomb is, is you know, more powerful than a chemical bomb, et cetera. If you bring them about the same kind of level, then what you get all kinds of bizarre things happening. Like if you try to make a cake and you put all your ingredients in and you pop it in the oven, well, if if nuclear energy transitions is about the same as electromagnetic energy transitions, then as you bake your cake, your your flour, etc., can transmute into lead. All right. So you can do you can do nuclear reactions at thermal energy scales. So that sounds again like in that kind of situation. What would life do? Like, you, imagine you went out on a sunny day and sunlight started to turn the uh, the carbon in your skin into strontium or something. I, you know, the, whatever kind of nuclear kind of things you can imagine. It would seem that 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 environment, even though there's more complexity there, because you can you can do lots more stuff. Maybe it's just too much. You know, maybe, so maybe complexity works well when it's on a boundary, but when you have too much of it, you head into chaos rather than, than the, the stable environments that we need for life. But again, I look, I'm, I'm sort of guessing at some level because the, the notion of trying to understand life in a more complex universe is hard to do because it's hard to even understand life in this universe as it is. Um, but you can see that if you add in options, then maybe it works for some things, but for lots of other things, it's it's a negative. Mm. Okay. Well, there. Before we move on, there is one last aspect of the standard model that I wanted to talk about. There's still a lot of uh, confusion about it, whether or not it's the. Uh, well, I haven't heard it referred to as the God particle since it was first discovered, but but um, where does the Higgs boson fit into fine tuning? And here it might do to have a bit more background on what it is. We can't take it for granted the same way we might a, a proton or an electron. Yeah, so the the Higgs particle is, as I said, is just one of the particles uh, of the standard model. And the, the important aspect is, is not necessarily the Higgs particle itself, but the fact that the existence of the Higgs means that there is a Higgs field through the universe. So... So in, in modern quantum physics, uh, everything's fields, right? So we have like an electron field through the universe and a ripple in that field is the electron. So you put ripples in the electron field, you get, you, you get experiments that see electrons. So we have the Higgs field and a ripple in the Higgs field gives us the Higgs particle, which we, we, we see at CERN. But the field has a particular property and what that means is that is that other particles um, take notice of the existence of the Higgs field. So there's a coupling between them. And that taking notice of the Higgs field, right, it is, is manifested as the mass of the particles, okay? So uh, the electron wiggle in the electron field, it, that wiggle senses the Higgs field, and the, the sort of reaction between the two sets the mass of the electron. And what we mean by mass there, of course, is, is essentially you know, how hard 
do you have to push on an electron to get it to accelerate? Okay, it's 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 that that kind of quantity that we we're dealing with, and so various particles have various kinds of couplings to the Higgs field. So the electron coupling is relatively weak, so the electron has a small mass. The quark couplings are slightly bigger, but not a lot bigger. So you know that gives the quarks their mass inside the protons and neutrons. The photon, it doesn't interact with the Higgs field at all, so it is massless. And then there's a few other particles, the, the W and the Z particle. They have a bigger interaction with the, the Higgs field, and, um, and so they, they're quite, quite chunky particles. So the, the Higgs field right, has this, this coupling to it, but it has this energy throughout the universe. And that energy is one of those things that we don't quite understand why it is the value that it is. And so again, that it, it could be anywhere in a, in a potential range. Of course, if we take the Higgs field down to zero, there, so it's such that it, it's, it's there, but it has zero everywhere, then that means that no matter what the coupling is between the particles, they don't get any mass. So without the Higgs field, everything is massless and zips around at the speed of light. And then when you wind the Higgs field up, you can make particles more and more massive. And you can, um, you can adjust the couplings of each of the particles as well. So you can change how, how much mass there is. So the, the Higgs plays a very important role in, in physics in that it gives the fundamental particles their mass. And it sets some sort of scale, but we don't understand why it quite has the energy that it does. And of course, there are, there are other questions about whether or not the Higgs field is related to the, some of the other mysterious fields we have in the universe. P people have suggested that maybe the Higgs field is related to this dark energy stuff that we see accelerate in the universe, that somehow there is a relationship between the two. Uh, again, nobody's really, really tied that down, but it's what people are looking at. So yeah, if we if we didn't have the Higgs, uh, the Higgs mechanism uh, and the Higgs field, yeah, particles wouldn't get any mass, and we would live in a, again a very different kind of universe, right? We we don't even we don't even really know how to understand some of these questions, right? If the electron was massless, how would it interact with the with atoms, right? So if you think about it, um, a, a proton, which is made of three quarks, uh, most of the mass of the proton doesn't come from the masses of the quarks in there. So you could make them massless and you can still end up with a massive proton because you, the mass comes from the energy of all the other things going on inside the proton. So you, can, you could build a proton and it would be a slightly different mass if you make the quarks massless. But if the electron doesn't have any mass, so it moves like a particle of light, but it still has charge, will it ever get captured by atoms? Will we ever get you know, neutral atoms in the universe where we have a massless electron? So again, it, it, it would be a very different universe if we didn't have the Higgs field. Some, some things would look similar, but other things would look radically different. So whenever we're talking about altering the masses of the up quark or the down quark or the electron, what we're really talking about is their coupling with the Higgs field. So the, the Higgs field is, even though we hadn't been talking about it before five minutes ago, it's extremely relevant to pretty much everything we've already discussed, even if it hasn't been named. Yeah, yes. Yeah, look, it, it, it definitely definitely ha does play a key role. But again, it, there are other complications in there, right? Because as well as said, as well as there being the Higgs field, there are the couplings between the the Higgs field and the and the part, particle fields, etc. So it's it's a it's a bit messier. But yeah, the Higgs plays a, a pretty central role. Okay, well, I think the the Higgs will come back when we talk a bit more about entropy. And maybe I'll be wrong, and you'll tell me that. Uh, my supposition is incorrect, but for the moment, I think we can turn our back to the standard particle and jump to the other side, which is relativity and gravity. So uh, our listeners should know very well by this point that the standard model doesn't account for gravity. 
And that's the whole, this, the crisis quote unquote in physics and people working on um, quantum gravity. But how does tinkering with gravity affect fine tuning? Yeah, well, well, of course, gravity plays such a central role in the in the universe, right? So uh, it, it it has shaped the universe since you know the the initial moments, and we don't think about it necessarily as gravity, but the expansion of the universe is relativity in action, right? And so the one of the things is we mentioned earlier on about um, the formation of the first elements, right? And the the that was during nuclear synthesis. That was tempered by the rate that the universe was expanding. So if you change the rate of expansion through nuclear synthesis, you change the outcome of nuclear synthesis. And I actually, I, I had this, a couple of students working on a few projects doing this, is that if you, if you slow down expansion, then you can extend nuclear synthesis. And in, in fact, what's kind of fun uh, well, for a physicist definition of the word fun, is that if you if you do that and you extend nuclear synthesis out, then what you can do is you can turn all of your atoms into into iron, right? So in, instead of the universe having a big bang and it, and then there being hydrogen and helium, which then go on to make stars, what you do is you you delay uh, nuclear synthesis. It keeps going, so it, it, hydrogen into helium. Helium into beryllium, beryllium into et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to iron. So if you imagine that the universe had been born um, and we'd had this delayed nuclear synthesis, then it would have been filled with iron, and that iron would have, could have fallen together to form iron stars, but iron stars don't burn, right? Iron, you can't use iron in nuclear reactions because it, it's it's... It sucks in energy rather than releases energy. So you, you produce these huge balls of iron that would be hot because they, they, there's lots of gravity acting on them, but they would radiate away that heat and they would just become giant cold cannonballs in space. So the, again, in, in, in doing that, you've, you've wiped out one of the key features for life in this universe, that we started with light elements, hydrogen and helium, that could be... Um, formed into stars, and then additional nuclear energy can be released because those elements are able to burn up into uh, eventually iron themselves through the, the lives of stars. So, so it, it, again, it's one of those interesting things about why, why nuclear synthesis finished with just a couple of the lightest elements. And it, it's tied to, uh, again, a back to that question of wh why was there this particular ratio of of matter to antimatter in the very early universe gets gets brought into this entire question again. So there's fine tuning at all steps of the way. And again, if you if you take the wrong path, you rapidly find yourself in a universe that that can't host life. Hmm. Well, b before we get before we move on, now that all of this evidence for fine tuning is mounting and mounting and mounting, I just would like to pause and ask what you make of it at this point well my own i guess my own personal outlook is that for me that the fine tuning is 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 a sign that we are in a multiverse that, we, that to me that's the that's the only um obvious solution that you know lets me sleep at night the 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 others i i'm not swayed by that the universe is special. I'm not swayed by, you no, know, there's a simulation hypothesis that we're, we're part of a computer simulation. I'm not swayed by that one really either. The multiverse one seems like the reasonable one for me. And, and again, if, if, you're, if there's a process that brings a universe into being, why would it stop at one? I, so I can imagine that there is some overall deeper mechanism going on somewhere where universes are created and that we are just one of many. So that, that's where I sit. Now, there you, you can, as I said, you run into lots of arguments with people, lots of arguments about statistics, lots of arguments about you have no prior over your your, your uh, probabilities, all this kind of stuff. So that, and that's true. Um, but your, for me, it seems like that that's the obvious solution is that 
that we are just one of many universes. Well, I, I we are going to quickly return to the the forward march we were on, but I'm surprised that you say that it lets you sleep well at night. Not that that wouldn't be comforting uh, to have finally solved the problem, but one of the main criticisms I hear of various multiverse hypotheses is that they aren't falsifiable. And then this is sort of what distinguishes them from science. And if you're a, a fan of Popper, it's what gets you into bad metaphysics. So what I wonder is why you, why you find the possibility so compelling when it's something that you can't really test and that we can't go out and find another universe. Yeah. So I look, I get this argument all the time and I get Popper thrown in my face all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine because because people seem to have misread something somewhere, right? The the multiverse is a hypothesis, right? So it's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. It's an idea for the solution. So people say to me, oh, it's not testable. And I have to ask them, well, how do you know? How do you know that a multiverse theory is not testable? Because we don't have a multiverse theory. We have a hypothesis. And we still need people to develop the series to know whether or not the multiverse picture is testable or not. So we are still in our hypothesis stage. And of course, we've had people like Roger Penrose, who's already suggested things like, you know, signs of colliding universes are written, could be written into the cosmic microwave background. And I, I don't give that idea that, that he's seen anything at any great weight. But, you know, that's where we need to get to with the, the, the idea of a multiverse. So we have to get out of this first stage of the scientific circle, so to speak, before we can start making definitive statements like it's not testable. Uh, and, and again, I, 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 I get this um, when this is discussed on, on Twitter slash X, etc. that pe people basically say, it's not testable, therefore it's not science. And I, I, every time I have to say, well, how do you know it's not testable? Who told you it's not testable? And then, w then when you've said that, people get a little bit more coy and they say, yeah, okay, it's a hypothesis. We can live with it and et cetera. And again, asking people, ask people why they're so certain that there is, there is only one universe. And it comes down to gut reaction. And then that's not science either, right? So again, uh, sorry to go off on a, on a bit of a rant there, but I, I do get that one uh, quite a bit. But I said, it allows me to sleep at night. I find it comforting, but it's, I said, it's not science until it's testable, but we don't know if it's testable yet. We need to get to that point where we can really say, uh, does, does the presence of other universes leave any imprint that we can detect? And we don't know yet. No, I, uh, your, your rant is welcome and much appreciated. I don't, I mean, I'm not informed enough to have a stake in the matter, but if you'll permit me a little more of a pushback, if it's a hypothesis without a, without a theory that we know of that would be testable, why do you still find it sufficiently plausible enough that it lets you sleep at night? Why select this hypothesis rather than the hypothesis that there is a creator that made it fine-tuned or or something else or so, it's just random so so look the, there are the other hypotheses right so there there's the hypothesis that you no know, that this is a one-off universe and it was born special i i just think that pushes the problem elsewhere i uh, i i am not a theistic person i see no sign of a creator if there was, I wish they were the creators of, of ancient Egypt because they were much more interesting than the, the current crop that we have. Um, so I, I, I don't find that compelling. So, so again, I'm, I'm going to put on my my Bayesian hat here because you know it's, that's where we carry things. My, my priors for those are, are, are exceedingly low, right? So if I look at my you know my suspects, I just find the 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 notion that there could be a process producing universes. I just, I just feel, and again, it's a gut feeling, right? Uh, I just feel that that's the the right kind of direction. Now, I might be wrong, and being a scientist, of course, 
you you have to you know put on your big boy trousers and say yes I was wrong about that it's not po- it's not politics right um, and I, I'm willing to be be wrong on that but you know there there is there is no evidence for uh, it, in my humble opinion for a creator for a simulated universe and for this being a one off universe there's no evidence for I, any of those things uh, you know y- your priors are different. Uh, if you're uh, um, Elon Musk fanboy or girl, of course it's the it's the simulated universe because that's what he he likes. But mine sits with the multiverse. Hmm. You said that um, randomness pushes the question elsewhere. Uh, a deistic account certainly pushes it elsewhere. Does the multiverse account not? Or, well, there are many multiverse accounts, so I should flag that. Do you not think that they push it elsewhere? Well, maybe, maybe. So the, the one of the interesting questions is 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 time infinitely far into the past? If you consider a multiverse, I, I mean, you get this situation with initial conditions, right? So you have to worry about the initial conditions. But if there were no initial conditions, okay, that so you you go. F- you just keep going back and keep going back and keep going forward and keep going forward. There is no time where you have to account for the the starting point. Then, 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 then maybe the maybe there's less of a problem there. Now that that probably sounds like quite a cop out, right? That I I've, I've gone and said, oh, there's an infinity over there, so we don't need to worry about this. And it probably is. But if something is going to be Weird. It may as well be the entire multiverse, right? That there was there was n- never a time where you needed to account for initial conditions. Again, I, I that's gut feeling. I am willing to be uh, shown wrong, but I, again, I, I it may be the ultimate kick in the can down the road because the road is infinite, right? Mm-hmm. But the buck does have to stop somewhere. And- uh, does it? Why? Well, I wasn't saying with time. I mean with our why questions. I mean something is going to have to be primitive, like time going on forever. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Rather than the universe is buck having to stop somewhere. Yes. I, I wasn't. I wasn't saying that. I, I was agreeing that it's going to have to stop with, or there either is it, there might not be a question why or an answer to the question why is there a multiverse something like that or why. If you're a string theorist, why are the fundamental constituents of the the universe brains? I mean, there there's just an answer somewhere. Um, have you read Max Tegmark's Mathematical Universe? I haven't. Uh, I've I've talked about it a bit with Tim Maudlin, but I am looking forward to reading that. Okay, so you know he he does have that kind of picture as well, and of course for him, the primitive is this. This environment where all maths, all possible maths, whatever that means, are playing out, and that our universe is in there as a mathematical algorithm churning away. But of course, as you said, they ask him where that maths is, ask him why the algorithms churn away, and all kind of stuff. That's the end of the why questions. But in there, he, you know, he basically says that uh, it's not just every possible universe that exists, but every possible universe across all possible mathematics exists uh so it's it's um it it's a different it's, i said it's, it's a different kind of picture but again it's the ultimate kick in the can down the road it's just this stuff it exists for some definition of exists and we're just a consequence of it mm. well thank you for permitting me this brief digression into asking your opinions. I'd like to get back onto our road through fine tunings and initial conditions have come up a number of times in the conversation so far. And I think this is a good time to bring up the role of entropy in life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th- this is one of those interesting topics. I, I was I'm currently teaching uh, general relativity and cosmology to my students, and we talk about we, we have to talk about entropy uh, quite a bit, and it clearly is a very confusing topic. So there's a couple of a couple of key things with regards to um, entropy uh, and the universe, which is um, 
which which is strange. So we 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 all have this sort of uh, school book picture of what entropy is, right? Something to do with disorder, something to do with messy bedrooms and stuff. But in in reality, what what entropy is is a uh, a, a movement of energy from a, a useful state to a useless state. And what we have with with uh, life on Earth, of course, is we receive sunlight, uh, you know, white light from the sun. It arrives, it gets processed by plants and animals and light, and it gets radiated out into the universe as infrared light. So the amount of energy in equals the amount of energy out, basically. But the 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 light, the photons have been degraded from white light, where they have short wavelengths, to infrared, which has long wavelengths, and so the the sort of usefulness of energy has decreased. And that process occurs across the universe. For everything that happens, there is a processing of energy from a a, a useful state into a more useless state. And that so that happens with everything. But when we ask the question, um, what was the initial state of the universe, right, compared to today? The answer is, is that the universe must have been at very low entropy. And what I mean by that is that the entire life of the universe has been the processing of useful energy into useless energy. And it's done a lot of it, right? There's been a lot of stars, etc. So there must have been a lot of useful energy stored up in the early universe, which has become useless today and will become even more useless into, into the future. And the question is, where was that energy? Where was it stored? And the, the, the sort of standard picture, which is one that Penrose has been pushing, is that um, that energy is stored in, a, in the gravitational potential. What happened is, is the universe was born, matter was effectively smoothly distributed, okay? And matter, when it's smoothly distributed and has a gravitational influence, that is a low entropy state because that energy, which is stored in the potential, can be released as matter gets dragged together due to the action of gravity. And then that gets crushed down into stars, and then you release nuclear energy. So it was the smoothness of the universe at, when it started that was meant to be the place where energy was, was harbored. Now, the universe could not have been completely smooth, because if the universe was completely smooth at the start, it would be completely smooth today. So um, there must have been tiny ripples in the distribution of matter in the universe, and those tiny ripples were the seeds where matter started to flow into galaxies and into stars, etc. And there's, there's a, a whole complicated process where these seeds sort of come from. But Penrose's question is, is, you know, why was the universe born effectively smooth, right? Why wasn't the universe born in a higher entropy state, i.e., why wasn't it born with clumps of matter? And ultimately, the question boils down to why wasn't the universe born filled with black holes, Right? Because black holes are the ultimately collapsed objects, right? So they, their gravitational potential, um, it, if you fill a universe with black holes rather than matter, the gravitational potential is really low because all you can do is get black holes to collide together, and that's it. So you can't release energy any, any other way. And so, so this really bothers Penrose, right? So the, this question of, of, of why the universe was born smooth not completely smooth, just you know, teeny bit away from smooth, rather than lumpy or filled with black holes, is one of those strange initial conditions for the universe. In fact, this has got this. It's got a. It's got a whole sort of mythology and things around it. It's known as the past hypothesis. The idea that the universe was born very special in terms of its arrangement, such that there would be lots of available energy that could be used to form stars power generations of stars and eventually get to planets and people, etc. Um, and you, you, there's a, a nice illustration in Penrose's book, um, I can't remember if it's The Road to Reality or one of the other ones, where he has this picture of uh, the divine being choosing the initial conditions for the universe in terms of the entropy. And there's a like a godlike figure and it's placing a pin into 
the phase spaces of all possible universes. And it's picking out this tiny volume, which is like 10 to the 10 to the some huge number. That's the chances of that uh, point being picked out. And to Penrose, this question of the initial entropy is the big question. That the other bits of fine tuning, that's, that's almost uh, icing on the cake, right? Because if, if our universe was born with, with no available uh, useful energy to use, it doesn't matter about what complexity there is because there's no energy to drive anything. So you, yes, you end up with a periodic table, but it, 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 what, what's the point? It, it, if, without a flow of energy from, from um, useful to useless, you cannot have life. That, I think that's like one of the most basic statements that we have. So yeah, entropy plays one of the key central roles in, um, in life in the universe. And the fact that we started at very low entropy is one of the big mysteries. And it, it, it wasn't just Penrose that this bothered, right? It, it, it bothered um, um, Boltzmann as well. So, you know, Boltzmann didn't know that we lived in a universe with a finite start. So he didn't think that we lived in a universe that had a special start and has been evolving. So to him, he thought the universe was essentially at a state of maximum entropy everywhere. And every so often you get a fluctuation, a statistical fluctuation of order. And that from that order, you get the life of the universe. So we are on like uh, uh, an upward trend back to maximum entropy and we're part of this fluctuation. So it bothered Boltzmann and it bothers people like Penrose and it bothers me that the initial stages of the universe seemed quite special with regards to this sort of entropy picture. Hmm. David Albert, who coined this term, the, the term, the, the past hypothesis has been on the show a number of time and it's been great to talk with him. But I have a question about the early conditions in the universe. And I think this idea of useful and useless energy is going to be very helpful in answering this question I'm about to pose, which is the early universe was very homogenous. And at the same time, it was very low entropy. But when entropy is typically explained, the states of very high homogeneity are the high entropy states. So when we think of um, an egg and an omelet, I mean, the egg is the one that's in a lower entropy state because it is quite hetero heterogeneous. And for the given macro state, it could have a much smaller possible amount of micro states and still be indistinguishable. Whereas the omelet could have far more many micro states and still look the same. So when the universe is so uniform and so homogeneous, there are so many different micro states where it would look the same roughly. So I'm just, I, I don't really understand where the high entropy, the low entropy of the early universe comes from if it has this very uniform configuration. Um, so the problem is, is that your, your notion of microstates, when you include gravity, it becomes different, right? So, so the, so the, the, let's go back to the, the usual example that we have, right? And gas in a room. And, you know, it, we, if we had all the gas in one corner uh, and we let it go, then it would f fill the room, right? So, uh, so when that gas, of course, is located in just the corner, it has lots of potential energy, right? In the sense that if I... If I had that gas and it was all in a balloon, I could put a little little mo little fan on there, and as I released the gas into the room, the fan would spin. I could extract that energy as the gas fills the room. But once we get to the stage where the gas is uniform in the room, my little propeller stops spinning, right? So there's so you 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 need a pressure difference to extract energy in a gas. Okay, so the potential is to do with going from um, 
the gas being condensed to the gas being spread out. And as I said, for gas, you look at look at the room, and I could rearrange the molecules in here, and they look basically the same. When you introduce gravity, though, right? So for the gas in the room, it doesn't really care about uh, gravity at all. But once you introduce gravity and ask, where is the useful energy? And the useful energy is right, when, when you have gravitation is when particles are far apart. So if I, you know, if I wanted to play the same experiment and I, I have, um, let's say I've got a big mass and I have a paddle wheel and I have lots of little masses spread around and I hold that paddle wheel, then as all the little masses fall in and they, they could spin up the paddle wheel, I can extract that energy as m matter falls inwards, right? Um, once all the matter has collapsed down into a, in, into a single region, then I can't extract any more of that energy again. So the useful energy when you take into account gravity is when everything is spread out because the energy is released when things collapse together. Whereas for gas, the energy is released when you go from having your gas confined to having your gas spread out. So you have to do more than just look at uh, the, the counting of microstates in the same way as you do with, with gas, because what you're talking about as well is how many ways can you clump all this material together, right? Uh, and and again, it, it, of course, it all works out. Uh, but with gravity, you almost have the reverse picture of of what you have with your gas. And this is why this is why people struggle to you know get a clear picture in their mind. As you said, with the early universe, matter being smoothed out should be low entropy. Uh, sorry, it should be high entropy, but only if there was no gravity, right? So if, it was, if there was no gravity, then that gas would just stay there, right? It wouldn't ever clump down. But you turn on gravity, then you, you can start to pull things together. That was, sorry, dog shaking his ears. That was very helpful. That's a question that's been nagging me for a long time. And that was a great answer. And I'd like to connect it back to something we spoke about a little earlier. I said I thought that the Higgs field might come in again. And what I'm wondering is you just talked about how gravity was very important for this low entropy state. And gravity is tied to mass. And mass, as we've just talked about, is tied to the Higgs field. So when the universe was very young and uniform, my understanding, it was also very hot. And forces merge and separate at distinct temperatures. And I'm wondering if the heterogeneity that came out of the homogeneity has to do with the way that the Higgs field emerged in lowering temperatures and whether this in turn triggered some of the gravitational collapse by giving mass to these seething particles? Well, again, that's an interesting question. And we're, we really are talking about the early stages of the universe here where the physics is still somewhat uncertain. And so it's, it, the general kind of picture that people think is that these inner homogeneities were written into the universe during this period of inflation. So when the, when the universe basically went through this rapid expansion due to the presence of this field called the inflaton, because physicists are rubbish at naming things, um, so there was this field existed for a tiny, tiny fraction of a second that caused this burst of expansion. And then after that burst of expansion, material was dumped back into the universe, right? So energy dumped in, turned into material. And from that point onwards, that's when we start to get into the, you know, the quarks and the protons and neutrons and electrons, etc. So the, the, the inflaton is a mystery, Okay, so in the same way that dark energy is a mystery today, the, the inflaton in the early universe is a mystery. We don't know where it came from. We don't know where it went. Now, this has led some people to suggest that dark energy is just a 
present day manifestation of the Infoton, that it was there in the early universe. It's sort of hid in the background and then has come back again. And others have suggested that maybe the Higgs field is tied to, to all of this, that Higgs is somehow tied to the Infoton, right? So as you said, when masses, uh, when, when particles got their masses, is related to inflation, is related to matter being dumped in the universe, is related to dark energy today. So there is sort of like a patchwork picture where people have tried to suggest that these things are all tied together. The problem is, is with the infoton and inflation itself, it's still very slippery. I mean, we we I mean, there's a, a billion theoretical papers on inflation, um, but what inflation was, what the infoton was, what kicked it off, and how it's related to the other. Uh, fields in the universe, it's still, you know, guesswork more than anything else. Okay. Well, the, the, I'd like to come back to dark matter and dark energy, but I think while we've been on the topic uh, or as we're leaving the topic of entropy and initial conditions, it might be worth making this transition to the end conditions. And Naturally, what happens at the end of the universe isn't, or maybe maybe you'll disagree with me, it's not totally connected to fine-tuning in that various things could happen at the end of the universe. What matters for us right now is what's happening right now. But is there a time when life must end in the universe? Probably. I mean, um, we, we know that... So, so the vast majority of stars that will ever live have been born already, right? So the, the rate of star formation is winding down. And in roughly a ballpark number, like 100 trillion years, I think the number is, the last star will go out. And it'll be a faint little red dwarf. It'll blink out. Universe goes into darkness. So life is going to find it hard, but not impossible uh, in that state of the universe. Things get really bad, though, once we get to the order 10 to the 30 years or so, because on those timescales, um, that's when we think protons decay. So you get out beyond 10 to the 30 years, then the stuff of matter itself will start to melt away. And the question I guess you have is, is what do you do? If you're, if you're a living thing and material around you is, is, is melting, then you're going to have this, this sort of constant um, need to regenerate yourself, but that requires energy. And where do you get that energy from? So, you know, you're, there's the, the future is going to be this scrabbling game for trying to find the last sort of available energy to do anything, but it's all basically disappearing. And then once you're out to like 10 to the 100 years, then, then all the black holes evaporate as well. And they'll be the last sort of bursts of energy in the universe, uh, again, I, I, it would be very hard to imagine any life lasting that long to, to make use of that energy. But by, you know, by that point, I think not that long after the last star, I think life is going to find things very difficult if it's, if it's confined to this universe, right? If it, if it finds a way to hop to another universe, then maybe things will be fine. But if it's stuck here, then things are going to get very grim. Now, maybe this really just totally stretches our current understanding of physics around what happens when space and time have been so stretched. But even after the last black holes have dissipated, isn't there always the, I mean, vanishingly low probability of Boltzmann brains or planets or solar systems or entire galaxies just spontaneously coming to existence due to quantum fluctuations or thermal, random thermal motion. It's all, isn't it always possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you just, you, you, we're going to end up in a universe, uh, which was what Boltzmann was thinking about. And so, yeah, the notion that we could have Boltzmann brains. Uh, so, you know, these are fully formed brains with memories, et cetera, pop into existence. Um, that's somehow written onto the, the future life of the universe. And of course, th this, this is um, 
one of those things that people get really tied up in a knot over because if we are going to end up in that universe with an infinite future ahead, then there's an infinite number of possibilities to make Boltzmann brains. So the notion of consciousness over the life of the universe, that physical consciousness, us today, assuming I'm not a Boltzmann brain, um, is going to be a vanishingly small portion of all of the possible consciousnesses that could exist. So people have been trying to find their way out of the, the Boltzmann brain argument. And one way you can do that, of course, is by saying that there is not really a future uh, which is infinite ahead, that there will be potentially a process whereby this universe comes to an end and new universes are born. Because in that distant future universe, there's still going to be dark energy. At the moment, we don't know, like dark energy seems to be this thing. Uh, it sits through the universe what if on immense timescales that dark energy undergoes like a, a quantum transition to a different energy state, releases that, some energy, maybe that energy gives birth to new universes. Maybe that's part of this cycling that's part of the multiverse. So that might be one way out of the multiverse question is that our universe, uh, not multiverse, out of the Boltzmann brain question, is our universe will ultimately face an end and in that end, we'll give birth to new universes. But again, we're in the realm of science fiction and speculation here rather than, than hard science. Right. I guess for the purposes of our conversation, I'm not so concerned about the problems around consciousness and whether or not we're Boltzmann brains. I just have in mind, I think it was Sean Carroll who introduced this idea that just as there could be Boltzmann brains, there could be Boltzmann planets or galaxies. I mean, they're going to be, they're much more complex than Boltzmann brains, so they'll be much more rare. But even well after the normal universe is dead, I mean, as physics has it now, there isn't, there wouldn't really be an end to life since it could just continually, continuously, spontaneously emerge, although it on very rarefied timescales. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you do run into that problem that the bolts were already recognized is is um is why is our universe so big right so if if we are a fluctuation why was the fluctuation so large that it's bigger than we can see uh, because you don't need a, a, a universe scale fluctuation to have uh, a, a boltzmann planet or a boltzmann galaxy right so you could imagine that you have a galaxy formed out of nothingness but just beyond that, there's chaos, right? There's maximum entropy just beyond there. And maybe you can get life, et cetera, in that galaxy and it doesn't see anything else out there. So I said that this is a question that bothered Boltzmann is, is, is if, if we are a fluctuation, why is the fluctuation so big? Because as you said, Boltzmann planets and Boltzmann galaxies should be much more common than Boltzmann universes. So yeah, he, yeah, he didn't have an answer to that question. Hmm. Well, the... The last topic that I wanted to broach today is another that you've done a lot of work on and that's come up in the conversation a few times already. And I guess it's two things. It's dark energy and dark matter. And maybe we should first just explain what they are, how, and if they're related before we get into the relationship to fine tuning. Okay. So, so um, dark matter is the dominant mass that we have in the universe. So we have, we've actually known for almost 100 years that there has to be mass out there that we can't see. Um, but it was really uh, the coming of the like uh, 19, 1970s where people realized that, that this unseen matter has to be dominant. And what I mean by dominant is that there, there are often like at least 10 times as much dark matter in a location as it is visible matter that you can see in terms of stars and, and starlight and all that kind of stuff. And dark matter can't be something like atoms because atoms interact with light. And the whole point with dark matter is, is it, it, light, light is just travels through it. It's transparent. So th that's been known, said for you know almost 50 years now that, that definitely there's a lot of dark matter out there. What we have uncovered in the last 25 years, of course, is that um, that's not the only dark component in the universe. So people looking into the distant universe, looking at these exploding stars called supernova, they were trying to measure the rate of expansion of the universe, and they expected that rate to be slowing down. 
So, you know, a universe is born, it's expanding, and they expect that expansion to be slowing. But what they found is instead of slowing, the distant universe appears to be speeding up. Right? So the, the conclusion from that is, is that if we look at Einstein's cosmological equations, we need to put a term in there to give us this accelerated expansion. And the only term that we can add that can do that is this stuff we call dark energy, right? So it's not like matter. It's a very different kind of energy. And it accounts for 70% of the energy density in the universe. So it's the dominant energy that's there. It's very spread out. It looks like it's uniform. So, you know, there's some here inside my hand, but the the um, gas in the room dominates it in terms of how much energy is inside uh, inside my hand. But dark dark energy is everywhere. Um, now, the question about whether or they're not uh, whether or not they're related, we don't know. Um, people think that dark matter is potentially a particle that we haven't yet discovered as part of the standard model of particle physics. Dark energy, well, there doesn't seem to be a natural place for dark energy in any of our physical theories. We really don't understand what dark energy could be, right? There's Again, there's lots of ideas, uh, lots of suggestions for fields and all this kind of stuff, but nothing robust. Nobody's come away and said, ah, you know, we've, we've nailed what dark energy is. I think that I have wrapped my mind around the idea of dark energy being everywhere, but the way that dark matter is typically portrayed, it's seen sort of around the edge of a galaxy in a sort of halo. And oh, yeah, so that's that's a that's a that's a terrible name. That's the problem. So so it, the picture, yeah, the word halo. Uh, makes you think that it surrounds, but that's not the, the not the truth. So dark dark matter actually um, is concentrated in the middle of the galaxy and drops off towards the edge and then continues outside. So it goes out into a region of the galaxy we call the halo because it surrounds the galaxy we can see. But dark matter actually um, feeds all the way into the center of the galaxy. Okay, that that answers one question for me and raises another. So the question that it answers for me is I had been confused about why dark matter would help through gravity keep the galaxy together uh, when in like a model like the solar system, it's the, the star at the center that keeps the planets from flying out. So if it were outside, it just, I wouldn't have understood as well but this makes more sense but then the question that it raises for me is that i thought that one of the major problems granted that i i believed that dark matter was outside of galaxies one of the major problems we had in or have in determining what it is is that it is so distant but based on what you've just told me if it is everywhere and it's concentrated also in, in the middle of the galaxy then we should be able to find it in something like the large ha in a particle accelerator or terrestrially in some is that accurate we don't have to be looking for it through telescopes no no so so yeah um if you do that you've probably got like 10 dark matter particles in there oh, okay right so they they are they're here right um so yeah there are definitely experiments that people are trying to do here on earth so number one is of course the Large Hadron Collider, they, they're looking to smash things together to produce a dark matter particle. And, and everyone wants to do that because that would be Nobel Prize winning stuff. So that, that gets people excited. But there are other people trying to do direct detections. So there are a whole bunch of experiments. There's, um, there's one called Dharma Libra, which is in, um, in Italy. It's, it's, in a, uh, it's in the Gran Sasso road tunnel. There's a laboratory there. It's basically a giant crystal of salt and it's very pure and th what they are doing is that they've got that sitting there and they've got dark matter particles coming through and they're hoping that every so often a dark matter particle will strike one of the the atoms and kick out an electron and produce a little flash of light and and of course they they already see little flashes because radioactivity and Neutrinos. um cosmic rays already produce a signal so Dharma Libra 
has, has actually found this sort of modulated signal that seems to go up and down on a on a yearly basis. And they suggest that that is due to, um, so here's the sun and here's the Earth's orbit. So the sun travels this way, like so, I should try that again. And so if you can think about it, for <clears throat> part of its orbit, the, the Earth is going into the dark matter and part of the orbit means it's coming away. So if you've got like, it's like in, being in the rain, running into the direction of the rain and running away from the direction of the rain, you get different levels of wetness, right? So what they're suggesting is that this modulation is due to the Earth's orbit going through like the, the dark matter of the Milky Way. Um, the problem is, is that only they've seen it and there are other experiments looking for it and they haven't found it. But in Australia at the moment, um, there's a gold mine in a town called Stahl and they're building the Sable Laboratory and they're building um, a not identical but very similar experiment, big chunk of, uh, of, of uh, salt and they're going to look for that signal here as well. And the reason that you want it in the Southern Hemisphere is that some of the variation that you get might be seasonal Right? They're in a road tunnel. So even the flow of traffic through the tunnel changes through the year and might be imprinted on the signal. If you pop it in the southern hemisphere, of course, our seasons are six months out of phase. So if we see the same peaks and troughs in the southern hemisphere, then that suggests it's an external signal. If we see them out of phase, it suggests that they're picking up something to do with the, the seasons on Earth. So yeah, people are trying to do direct detection of, of dark matter. Well, this is terrific because my understanding of dark matter has just totally shifted. I had not realized that there were 10, 10 particles in my hand. I thought they were all very distant. So, okay, that's awesome. And then the, the last thing, though, to finish up with here is where do dark matter and dark energy fit into fine tuning? Well, so... They fit in quite a bit, um, but the fact that we know so little about them makes them even harder to understand. So the so dark matter dominates the universe, and we don't know quite when dark matter was formed. It was probably formed after inflation, so therefore it's somehow tied to the the standard model of particle physics. But the problem that we have is that you know there's dark matter dominates, which means that. After the Big Bang, it's dark matter that collapses and pulls the gas along for the ride, which produces galaxies and stars. Now, if we have significantly less dark matter, then that scaffolding in which we form galaxies and stars, that disappears, right? So that would cause real problems in that we, it would take a lot more effort for the universe to form galaxies and stars, which we need for life. If we have a lot more dark matter, then that gets things to clump a lot faster and pulls gas in, and it very rapidly can turn gas into black holes, right? You can run through the entire se sequence of forming stars, etc., massive stars, they explode, etc., and then make black holes. So you can, you can run through the entire sort of um, sequence we need to form heavy elements very, very quickly, and maybe there's not enough time there for, for life to form. Dark energy, though, is, is a, a much more dangerous thing for life in the universe. So if we had no dark energy, then everything would have been basically the same. But if, if we had had, say, 10 times as much dark energy as we do now, that would mean that the epoch of acceleration would have started 10 times earlier in the universe. So instead of occurring 5 billion years ago, it might have been half a billion years after the Big Bang. So if you imagine that that dark energy accelerated expansion kicks in, so the Big Bang is formed, hydrogen and helium, and it's all starting, galaxies starting to clump together, but then the universe starts to accelerate. Then all of that stuff that was falling together gets pulled apart again. So you end up, if you, if you have too much dark energy, you turn the universe into a, a thin soup of material very, very early on. And again, if you do, do that, no galaxies, no stars, no planets, no people, right? So you shut off that entire route. Now, again, exactly how much dark energy you need to do that is 
uh, it's a kind of complicated thing because even if you have a little bit of extra dark energy, you still form galaxies, but you form them very compact because you get this rapid clump in. And small galaxies are not good places for life because there's just too much going on. So it's probably a complicated relationship, but you wind up dark energy by you know, more than a few, then that's detrimental to life. Now, again, we don't know what the range of potential um, dark energy densities in the universe could be, right? So mi minimum is probably zero. The maximum, some people suggest that that's around 10 to 120 times as large as the dark energy we see today. So if you imagine that you had a, a, a dice with 10 to the 120 sides to it, and you roll it, the chances of it coming up one, which is what we need for our universe today, is small. Chance of it coming up 10, which is, you know, a bit dodgy for our universe, it's more likely to come up with a number, let's say, 10 to the 56. And uh, that means no chances of life whatsoever. So again, why we've got dark energy in our universe and why it's comparatively so small that it's allowed roughly 10 billion years of nice-ish evolution for the stars so we can be here. But in the future, it's going to shut down everything as the um, expansion accelerates. Why it's sort of so small is a, is a big question. Hmm. Well, Jermaine, the last thing I want to do is return to the middle of our conversation where we were talking about the multiverse. And just to end, granted that it's a hypothesis, we don't have a theory. Is there a, a camp or an approach that you find most promising that you that sort of lets you put a face to the multiverse when you go to sleep? Like I have in mind the, the string theoretic island multiverse conception. I mean, I'm sure there are far more than I'm even aware of, but do you have any thoughts on this? No, I must admit, I look at, I, I, I it's the overall concept I'm kind of happy with. The, the precise mechanisms, I think we are only just starting to scratch the surface. You know, the, the string theory landscape is a possible, but is string theory even the right direction? Uh, so I think, again, this overall picture where you create universes and they get different laws of physics, at that level, I think, yeah, I'm kind of happy with that. But to get into the details of what is creating the universes, how are they sort of you know, doing their, you know, birth and rebirth, et cetera, and how the laws of physics are written, I think is still something that uh, we don't really have a handle on at the moment. So I, I don't worry about those that much. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. This has been exactly the deep dive into fine tuning I've been waiting for. So thanks for taking the time to have this conversation with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.